You are listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Ambusters and the Race to Save Britain by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books and narrated by Mark Felton. Chapter 6. Snookered Why doesn't he fire? The top gunner in Pitcairn Hill's lumbering Hamden exclaimed as he watched horrified as a Messerschmitt BF-109 fighter, its nose painted a livid yellow, lined up a few hundred yards in the gloom off the British aircraft's tail. The overloaded Hamden still had its landing gear fully extended and locked in place and was trying to make it to the North Sea coast as fast as possible in the dawn gloom when the German fighter had suddenly approached. But then Pitcairn Hill realised why enemy cannon shells were not, at that moment, tearing his plane to pieces. The Hamden had often been criticised by RAF pilots for its Germanic appearance, with its large glass crew compartment at the front and long tail boom and twin rudders. In the poor early morning light, the Luftwaffe fighter pilot had mistaken the Hamden for a German bomber, probably a Dornier DO-17 the effect enhanced by the fact that the Hamden's undercarriage was down. It looked for all the world as though the Hamden was about to land in Denmark. Hold your fire, boys, Pitcairn Hill ordered, cold beads of perspiration running down his back. He thinks we're one of theirs. The two gunners crouched at their machine guns, fingers on the triggers as the BF-109 weaved slightly behind them, before suddenly shearing off and diving away. He's gone, Skipper, the ventral gunner reported, his voice cracking with tension. OK, keep your eyes peeled, Pitcairn Hill ordered. Navigator, how long till we reach the coast? Ahead of them stretched a five-hour journey across the North Sea to Lincolnshire. German fighters intercepted him several more times, but each time the Hamden's appearance seemed to satisfy them and they backed off without firing a shot, despite the RAF roundels clearly displayed on the wings and fuselage. By the time the Hamden touched down at Scampton, everyone was totally exhausted, but thankful to be alive. Pitcairn Hill would face a dressing down from squadron leader Bridgman and a fair amount of ribbing from his comrades, but it was nonetheless good to be home. When Group Captain Huskinson's report reached the operations staff at the Air Ministry on the 3rd of June 1940, the idea of a naval solution to the problem of destroying the twin aqueducts was immediately seized upon. No one was interested in dropping 2,000-pound armour-piercing bombs from 5,000 feet. It was a ludicrous suggestion, given Bomber Command's accuracy record with its basic aiming equipment. But dropping some kind of mine into an aqueduct suddenly appeared both feasible and attractive. Nothing was readily available, but, wrote Group Captain V. E. Groom optimistically, we might be able to modify a depth charge so that it could be dropped from an aircraft. I am under the impression that the explosive content of a depth charge is even higher than that of an M-bomb. Wing Commander Bennett's colleague Thomas Trail took an immediate interest. Age 40, Wing Commander Trail was a World War I hero. While serving in the Royal Flying Corps in 1918, Trail had shot down eight German aircraft, making him officially an ace. Awarded one of the first distinguished flying crosses when the RAF was formed. By 1940, Trail was Assistant Senior Air Staff Officer at Bomber Command Headquarters. Would a number of depth charges or M-bombs do the trick, Trail wrote on the 3rd of June 1940 to the Ordnance Board, or is there sufficient depth of water to obtain the required amount of blast effect? The Ordnance Board's reply was guardedly optimistic. We consider the explosive content of the M-bomb adequate if placed within the waterway, but the board also added that this was really a naval matter, and we believe that the water depth is inadequate to guarantee the necessary hammer blow which will result in real damage. It was clearly time to ask for the senior service's opinion. What the? Joe Collier exclaimed as the night air was suddenly illuminated by two long lines of red tracer bullets hammering past his cockpit canopy like enraged hornets. 
he immediately wrenched the Hamden over and dived sharply away. Caw, sir, he's shooting at you, crackled wireless operator Sergeant Johnson's excited voice in Collier's headset. What shall I do? You bloody fool, Collier shouted as he banked the plane even harder. I can see that, he gasped, both hands on the yoke. Shoot the bastard! The sudden action had flared as Collier was contemplating yet another gardening sortie over the Baltic that night. Having no onboard radar, the British plane was completely blind to threats, and the twin-engine German Messerschmitt Bf 110 night fighter had closed in on his tail like a hungry shark that smelled blood in the water. Fortunately, the Germans' aim was off, and Collier and his crew managed to escape. But it was not lost on any of them that only a few feet had spared their aircraft from being turned into a flaming torch. Wing Commander Willie Snaith, commanding 83 Squadron at Scampton, blew into the officer's mess, startling the group of pilots who were lounging about in armchairs discussing the debacle at Dunkirk. Everybody jumped to his feet. Snaith waved them back into their chairs. Any of you fellows any good at billiards or other games of skill? Snaith asked mysteriously. There was a deathly silence as the pilots tried to work out what on earth their illustrious CO was cooking up. For several weeks now, the squadron, along with number 49, had been night bombing industrial targets inside western Germany with varying degrees of success, as well as continuing with mining operations. The flak and searchlights over the German targets was growing steadily more extensive and fierce as the battle in France started to wind down to its seemingly inevitable conclusion. 83 and 49 were doing what they could to try and hamper Hitler's war machine, but they were only making a small dent and losing plenty of men and planes for their troubles. I want two volunteers, Snaith announced and without a pause pointed at Pitcairn Hill and Guy Gibson. You and you. The two victims rose from their seats and followed Snaith up to his office, mystified and a little apprehensive. On his desk was a plasticine model of a railway tunnel. Pitcairn Hill and Gibson exchanged glances, Gibson raising his eyebrows before Snaith started to speak. The job was simple. Bomber Harris had conceived of aiding the situation in France by cutting German railway communications. After some thought, a way to do this effectively had been dreamt up. As you know, Snaith said, the most vulnerable points of railways to attack are bridges and tunnels. The former are very hard to hit, but the latter resolve themselves into a simple problem. The two pilots nodded as if they knew what the hell Snaith was talking about. Just now, I asked whether you played billiards. Well, actually, I meant snooker. And what I want is just that. I want a couple of fellows who will drop their bombs so that they will roll into the tunnels and explode a few seconds afterwards. The idea was so simple. The bombs would block the railway for days. The tunnels are near Aachen. Takeoff is at ten tonight, Snaith added, a large grin plastered across his face. Pitcairn Hill and Gibson's aircraft travelled together to the targets. Their course took them past Rotterdam, which Gibson noted was still smouldering from the German air attack in May, then past Brussels and on to the ancient city of Aachen, just inside the German border. The navigators, with great skill, brought them up on the first railway tunnel to be blocked. Gibson approached and dropped an illuminating parachute flare, which burned brightly, bathing the area for a few minutes in a jaundiced yellow glare. Gibson dived straight into the attack. Hugging the railway track, his Hamden tore on towards the tunnel entrance like a single-engine fighter on a strafing run. The hillside above the black tunnel mouth loomed larger and larger as Gibson held the Hamden just off the deck. The bomb doors were open, revealing four 500-pound GP bombs sitting in the bay ready for release. Steady. Steady. Right a bit. Steady, the navigator called from the aircraft's nose. Bomb's gone, the navigator yelled, jerking the bomb release toggles, sending two of the 500-pounders bouncing into the entrance, while Gibson wrenched the yoke back with all his strength to try and clear the hill above the tunnel. The engines screamed, and the Hamden pulled up almost vertically, Gibson noticing treetops passing by on either side of his wingtips, and then they were clear. 
The navigator quickly read out the new course, and pausing to breathe for a moment, Gibson hauled the bomb around and set off for the next tunnel. As they left, the crew saw that the tunnel entrance had collapsed before the flare finally burned out. In the meantime, Jamie Pitcairn Hill was circling above his first target, another railway tunnel some miles from Gibson's, when he saw an astonishing sight. Steaming along through the German countryside was a goods train. Even from a thousand feet, Pitcairn Hill could make out the glow from the engine's footplate as the train steamed full speed towards the tunnel entrance. He quickly dropped a parachute flare, brightly illuminating the whole area. The train came sharply into focus, a cloud of black steam pouring from the engine as it went as fast as possible towards the safety of the tunnel. The drivers must have been terrified that the circling British aircraft was going to bomb or strafe them in any minute. But Pitcairn Hill smiled grimly. He had another idea. Quickly, he flew past the tunnel entrance until he found where the tracks emerged on the other side of the hill and dived in to launch his first two bombs. After collapsing the exit, he flew back to the entrance and repeated the process, bowling two more 500-pounders into the entrance, blowing it down and entombing the train. For a vicar's son, it was a remarkably uncharitable performance, but effective nonetheless. He's bought it, Flight Lieutenant Joe Collier of 83 Squadron's B Flight exclaimed as he glanced out of his cockpit window and saw a Hamden going down like a flaming firecracker. He followed the burning aircraft as it tore towards the earth through the flak bursts, tracer and searchlights, horrified as he knew that Flying Officer Robbo Roberts, a New Zealander from his flight, was too low for the crew to jump when the flak had found them. He tore his eyes away a moment before Roberts Hamden smashed into the ground in a huge exploding fireball that flared across the German countryside. Another four men from 83 Squadron had just died. Leveling his plane off, Collier prepared for his bombing run, trying to put Roberts' horrible death out of his mind. His plane vibrated uncomfortably as the pilots had been ordered to desynchronize their engines, which was believed to render searchlights ineffective. But soon violent lurching and bucking replaced the vibration as Collier's plane was enveloped by the storm of lead and explosives that the Germans were hurling skyward with alacrity. The shells exploded with a roar like thunder, followed by the rending of metal and the tinkling crash of broken glass as shrapnel shredded the Hamden's fuselage. The plane would lurch and drop, causing the crew's stomachs to feel suddenly hollow before the pilot regained control. A few hours earlier at Scampton, Wing Commander Snaith had briefed his men on this new target that killed Roberts and his crew an oil installation codenamed A3, northeast of the Hamburg docks. Your bomb load will be four 500-pound bombs, fused instantaneous, and you will carry full petrol, Snaith continued with his briefing, his face serious. You can attack at any height from which the target is visible, but remember the moon is in the southwest, so the best direction for attack would be to come in from the northeast side of Hamburg so that you can see the reflection of the water in the dockyards. The gathered crews listened intently and scribbled their notes. Many looked all in, with black bags of exhaustion smudged beneath their glazed eyes. The pace of operations had become relentless over the past few weeks, and it was taking its toll, both mentally and physically, on the young men setting out to bomb Germany. Again, Snaith said, I must warn you that on no account are you to bomb towns or villages indiscriminately. Only this target may be attacked tonight. If you cannot find it, you must bring your bombs back. That is about all. Snaith gave details of raid timings and asked for questions. There was only silence. The navigating officer has got the maps ready, so you can all get down to working out your routes. Snaith smiled shyly and wished them all good luck. A few hours later, Joe Collier and Guy Gibson, flying at different heights, witnessed Roberts from B Flight meet his fiery end. The oil storage area was already well alight as A and B flights pounded it with high explosive bombs, but the flak was phenomenal. Squadron leader Dennis Field, who had temporarily taken over command of B-Flight, was also shot down. 
Collier would be placed back in charge of the flight. Gibson had developed a low-level dive-bombing technique in the hope of avoiding flak. Flying over the oil tanks, he saw one was fully ablaze. The others looked like large golf balls under the moonlight. He wrenched the control column over to the left and began his dive as flak shells peppered the sky around him. The dive was deep, the altimeter running backwards at a phenomenal rate as the needle of the airspeed indicator climbed. At the last moment, the bomb release order was yelled and Gibson leveled off. Did you see anything, Watty? Gibson yelled to one of his rear gunners. Not a thing, came the reply over the RT. I don't think they fell off. They must have, Gibson snapped back, incredulous that after all the effort, his bombs hadn't dropped. No, Jackie Withers, his navigator, chimed in. They're still on. I can see them. Gibson was apoplectic. He had no choice but to haul his aircraft around and return to the scene for another go. It was a daunting prospect. He climbed again, the engine straining at maximum revs until he reached 5,000 feet. The Hamden circled the area of the oil tanks, Gibson and his navigator trying to find them as flak continued to burst close by and searchlights danced all around them. Then Gibson noticed barrage balloons high above. It meant he was in amongst the cables, a potentially fatal error. Suddenly, he saw the tanks again below him and slammed the Hamden into an almost vertical dive, thundering down towards the ground at 320 miles per hour. At the last moment, the order to release the ordnance was given, and this time the mechanism functioned correctly, and Gibson pulled back on the stick with all his strength, also pulling at the tail trimming tabs. The manoeuvre generated enough g-force that the crew all blacked out until the plane levelled off. Coming to, the Hamden was suddenly illuminated by the searchlight beam, blinding everyone. Furious, Gibson banked over and charged down the beam, firing his Ford-mounted Browning machine gun in an attempt to knock out the infernal light before the flak guns managed to zero in on his position. There was a bang, and Gibson glanced to his right. The starboard wing was on fire. Leveling off, he hit the abandoned aircraft button, the signal to the crew to bail out, but nothing happened. Looking again, he realised that the wing wasn't on fire. A section had been ripped apart and was flapping in the yellow light of nearby searchlights, feigning flames. I think we've been hit, Gibson yelled over the RT. She feels funny. You bet she feels funny, Withers shouted back over the loud detonations of flak shells. There's a few hundred yards of balloon cable on your wing. Gibson's Hamden had struck the mooring cable of one of the German barrage balloons. He was lucky not to have lost his wing and crashed. With his controls heavy, Gibson nursed his stricken aircraft back to England, joined by the survivors of yet another raid on Hitler's supply infrastructure, raids that were now becoming the nightly norm for the young men of 49 and 83 squadrons. You have been listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters and The Race to Save Britain, written and narrated by Mark Felton on War Stories with Mark Felton. The Bridge Busters is available both in paperback and Kindle on Amazon. For great documentary films on fascinating war subjects, visit the YouTube channel Mark Felton Productions. And don't forget to subscribe and share for both of my channels.